privilege and honor to be able to share the Word of God with you this afternoon. And with that in mind, if you can just join me in prayer as we bow down before we listen to the Word. Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again for us to enter into your presence and be able to hear your Word and to uh, give you our worship, Lord, that is pleasing in your sight, Lord. We pray that you may, as your Word has been spoken, may you come and speak directly to our hearts, not just in our ears, but Lord, may it be words that really transforms us and leads us to live the life that you have called us, Lord. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and redeemer. We thank you in Jesus' name and pray. Amen. This afternoon, I want to share with you from a word from Isaiah chapter 43. And we'll just look at uh, four verses, Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 4. Uh, I'll read it for us if you can follow along with your eyes. Verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as a ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. Because you are precious in my eyes and honored, I love you. I give men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. Amen. So this morning, I, I want to share with you in, with the title, Remembering Who You Are. Remembering Who We Are. Okay? Uh, one of the greatest issues that happens in our society today is identity theft. Sad to say, this is prevalent and it's common among us. It's a problem because most of our information today is accessible through electronics and online activity, and therefore, we can be so prone to losing our identity. Some, someone, a hacker coming in and stealing our identity, posing as who we should be, stepping into our roles. Um, and they can get access to bank accounts, uh, emails, even social media, and everything around us so that they become actually who we should be. And these days, there's all different kinds of methods of how these people try to scam us and, and fall into identity theft. For example, uh, there are a lot of uh, text messages that I, I, I recently seen with one of our students was sharing with me. Um, her dad received an, uh, a text message saying, Dad, I just, uh, my phone just broke and I'm using someone else's number to text you. Can you send me 5 million won as soon as possible to this account? And, and lo and behold, the dad was panicking and called the daughter and luckily was able to get in touch and realize that it was one of those identity theft scamming uh, text messages. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but for me recently too, I received the phishing mail uh, um, of, and saying the king of Scotland um, wants to share his inher inheritance with me. And when I read that email, I was like, what, me? How much are they going to give me? Lord and behold, I checked the email. It says, King of Scotland, one, two, three, four, five, six, and realized it wasn't really from the King of Scotland. It never really ceases to amaze me how people come up with these creative ideas to wanting to scam us, to be us in our place. But let me tell you this morning, this may be prevalent in our society today, in our culture of identity theft, but this has been long been going on ever since the beginning of time, not maybe with our names, but spiritual identity theft that has been happening because of sin. You see, Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have, um, the, the, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give you life, life of abundance. And he points out Satan's goal in this life is to steal, kill, and destroy you. You individually, you in your families, and you in your communities. He will do everything possible to steal, kill, and destroy and one of the ways that he does so well is stealing your identity of who you are as a child of God. We have a tendency to forget that we truly are beloved children of God, loved by the Heavenly Father, the God who created the world with word of mouth, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. He is the Father to us. Amen? We, we have a tendency to forget that. And as a result of that, uh, we find ourselves in difficult moments and challenging situations where life presents itself and especially in those times, we tend to forget who we really are, 
okay? We forget who we are. We lose sight of his goodness. And we, we can't really live out who he has really made us to be because Satan has robbed us of that truth, of that identity. So Isaiah reminds us in chapter 43 today, when the hard times come, when the difficulties of life come in your life, when the enemy comes to attack you, when you don't know what's going to happen next in your life situations, it is important that you remember who you are in God, okay? And the background of this book of Isaiah, let me just give you a brief um, background, is the book of Isaiah is like a miniature Bible. It has 66 chapters, which coincides with 66 books of the Bible. The first 39 chapters of Isaiah talk about the judgment of God, okay? God is going to judge and deal with all those people uh, who are disobedient to his laws and his commandments, and as a result of that disobedience, the Assyrians and the Babylonian army come and sweep them off their homeland, and now they find themselves in captivity, in slavery, and in bondage. That's the situation in the people of the Israelites in the Old Testament we're dealing with. And let me just pause here for a second to let you know that slavery is just not a physical thing. It can also be beyond that, where um, sometimes we find ourselves in difficult moments unable to move past our experiences, and we fall into the bondages of this world. Habitual sin is a form of bondage. Debt that we have may be a form of bondage. Bad relationships that we have may be a form of bondage. And in the people in the Old Testament, they were living in this slavery, in bondage, and in captivity, because as a result of not being able to obey God. That's the word in the Old Testament times. But thanks be to God that there is the rest of the chapters in the book of Isaiah. The last 27 chapters in the book of Isaiah corresponds to the last 27 uh, books of the Bible, which is the New Testament. And in that, instead of focusing uh, so much more on the judgments of God, instead of focusing um, on what we deserve, God graciously reminds us of focusing of how God is working in us, with us, and through us. And aren't you glad today that even the times that we have messed up in our path, even the times that we have screwed up throughout the week, God is still there reminding us that we belong to him, that we are the children of God, and there is hope in Jesus Christ, okay? That God is still with us, he's working in us, he's, with, uh, he's working through us, and we get to have the opportunity to be a part of that. But the truth of the matter is, God allows that, not because we've been good, not because we have done something good, not because we're so deserving of this favor, but actually, if anything, uh, the only thing that we really deserve is to be struck down and dead, because Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And if we serve, and you know, and, and because of his mercy, because of his love, because of his grace that is extended to us, he gives us another opportunity to be able to get ourselves together and be able to live a life that he has called us to live. And if we understand that it's part of his grace, how can we not give praise to this heavenly father who extends his hand of grace to us daily? That his mercies are new every morning. The fact that he has brought us up, he, that he, he, he woke us up this morning is an evidence of his grace, isn't it? Because who, how many of us really think about when we go to bed, will I wake up tomorrow? You know, to, on a side note, what I experienced throughout the week, um, I went to the gym and I went to uh, work on my back or something and, and I went through some stretching and all of a sudden, through the stretch, I heard a pop on my back. And in that moment, I kind of cringed forward and I couldn't move. And you know, ever since then, I've been lying in bed and putting on a sock, putting on my pants. It's, it takes like 10 to 20 minutes. It's such a big chore. I'm like, how am I going to get through the day? And that in those moments, God reminds me, if it was not God who enables me to put one foot of, uh, in front of the other, if it was not God who beats my heartbeat, if it's not God who has breathed life into my life and my lungs to be able to breathe, I would not be alive today. And so all of us are living evidence of God's grace in this place. And I hope we remember that. And so here it is in this text, um, Isaiah 43, in this chapter where Isaiah reminds us, reminds us of is this. Even though you might have done some things in your life, even though you might have messed up in your past, even though you didn't always do what you were asked, of do, asked to do from God, 
Remember who you are. Remember your identity. Don't forget your identity. And when I was reading this, one of the things that came to my mind was a, a movie that I saw back in the day. It was one of my favorites called The Lion King. Anyone have seen The Lion King? If you haven't, man, this is to do your list today. You go home and watch Lion King. Not the, the real version, but the original version. And in that Lion King scene, you see uh, king of the land, Mufasa, comes and shows off his son Simba, the baby cub lion, who is next to be in line. But one person that wasn't happy about the situation was the jealous uncle, Scar. He said, no, he's not going to be king. I'm going to be king. You know what? I'm going to make him feel guilty and put him in a situation where he has to get out of this land. And so, in the middle, you know, he challenges uh, baby young cub Simba, says, hey, you need to be a grown-up. If you're going to be the king of the land, you should have some kind of power. In the midst of the wallaby, uh, wallaby stampede, there Simba is trying to roar. And he gets caught up, as we well know the story. Um, he's about to face death, and yet the savior, Mufasa, comes. His dad saves him, and, the, and he doesn't make it alive. And that scene we see the guilt and shame is upon Simba. And Scar points every responsibility and guilt on him, therefore causing him to run away. He's supposed to be the next uh, king in line, but yet he runs away. Where? To a jungle. You know, to be honest, I recently saw the real life version. And, and watching as a grown-up, I had a lot of questions. How is it that this lion runs into the jungle and starts hanging out with um, a meerkat and a warthog called Timon and Simba, and they're eating bugs together, having a great time, showing him how you need to live your life. Hey, it's problem free, Hakuna Matata, there's no worries, live your life. And he's enjoying himself. In the midst of that, this crazy monkey, Rafiki, comes along and reminds him, hey, I know who your where your dad is. I know where Mufasa is. He leads him to this pond. And in the midst of this pond, he sees the reflection of himself. He sees the reflection of his father. And up in the sky, he sees Mufasa uttering these words, remember who you are. You're not supposed to be here. You're, the, you're supposed to be the king, right? And yet you are here, so lost in where you originally should be. And a lot of times, I relate to that. The God of the universe, the king of all kings, claims us to be children of God, but yet there are a lot of times we live in this world with losing that sight, losing that focus, forgetting who we really are in Christ, okay? And so in this text, at the end of chapter 42, Isaiah says to the people, you know what, you've messed up. How you have failed to hear God and to see God, and you have done some crazy disobedient things as a people of God, and God is going to deal with you. But then in 43, he opens up verse 1, and he says, but now. But now, because that means it doesn't matter where you've been in your life previously, that was then, but this is now. But now, something good is about to change in your situation. Let me read the verse again for you. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. One thing you should understand about this text is that Jacob and Israel is the same person. Jacob was born, he had a twin brother named Esau, and when he was born, he clung onto the older brother, Esau's ankles. And later, he lied and stole the birthright of his older brother. And the name Jacob actually means swindler, thief, cheater, liar. Awkward question. Any Jacobs in the house? <laughs> it's, it's not my words, okay? It's what the Bible says, okay? Um, and so, God says, thus says the word, I created you even though I knew you were going to mess up, even though everything wasn't going to be right, even though you had some sins down in your soul, I didn't hold against you. But it continues, even though I created you, I formed you, O Israel. Which means that you were born one way, but when he came into your life, he had to move some things around and change some things about you, put you on a different path, and he has given you a new identity, a new name, calling you Israel. I mean, isn't that the story of us? Before we met Christ, we were Jacob, we were the liars, we were the cheaters. We were living in this world, not knowing who our father is, but yet God comes and we encounter him. He invites us and he transforms us and gives us a new identity. He says the old has gone and the new has come. And he's now calling us, live in confidence of who you are in me. 
And that's what we have to remember And Isaiah is saying, going back to the Old Testament references, saying, um, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, Israel. And thank God that we're no longer Jacob in sight of God. But I thank God because I'm no longer who I used to be. I am a new creation in Christ. And we are called to live in this new identity. He says, when I knew you, you were born, you were going to walk away from me. When I, when I knew you when you were born, you had some deep sin issues deep down inside of you. But I didn't stop there. I formed you, O Israel. And the word Israel in this name means the one who wrestles with God, the one who pursues God. So we see the true transformation after having met God from a person who was a cheater, who was a swindler, who was a liar, to a person now pursuing after God. And now with that name change, when you have a name change, don't let people back in the day who know you by Jacob continuously call you Jacob. But be confident in knowing to live out your life as Israel, for old has gone and the new has come. Now, here is how God helps us to shape into this new identity. When you find yourself going through some hard times, you first need to find out who you really are, okay? Remember who you are. But now, says the Lord, who formed you, let's continue on the verse. It says, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. He was the one who turned my life around. He is the one. He is the redeemer, right? He's the one who called you by your name. He's the one who dried your tears when you were crying yourself to sleep. He's the one who was helping you when no one was there to help you. He was there there by your side. He was the one. Not your money, not your education, not your accomplishments and achievements of life, but he himself was the one who dealt with something that all these other things of this world could not deal with, which was the sin issue. And so as children of God who have been redeemed, we give praise to God. We give thanks to God. And this is what we're here for this morning. We come to worship this God, being reminded of who we really are in him and how he continues to help us to walk each and every day. As we wake up, we, like I mentioned before, we wake up to new mercies every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. He's the one who did it. And he wants us to remember who we really are when we go through hard times that you used to be Jacob, but not your Israel. I have transformed you and changed your life and given you a new identity. I have redeemed you. The second part says, I have called you by name. Okay? Isaiah is pointing out that the sense of intimacy, love, and care of God to an individual. He isn't calling me by my old name, but he's calling you today by your new name. For you to recognize that no matter how many hard times that you go through in life, how many difficulties that you face that you have, that does not change what your name is. Your situations does not change your name. But we have a tendency when difficulties come to forget our name. Your name, what is your name? Well, you are a child of God. You are an overcomer. God says you are more than a conqueror. And so what God says is it doesn't matter if you're in the worst of the situations of of life that you're facing, don't forget where you come from. Remember who you are. But now, who created you, Jacob, who formed you, Israel, not to fear, for he has redeemed us, he has called us by name, and then on top of that, he claims us and says, you are mine. It doesn't matter if it's hard times. It doesn't matter if there's the ups and the downs, if you're in the valley or in the green pastures. Whatever you you are going through, remember that you belong to him. Even when the enemy comes to discourage you, and you know what, let me tell you, there will be times when the enemy will come and try to steal that away from you. Even the times that you've messed up, there's the enemy saying, there you go again, falling into that sin. God doesn't love you. How can you worship God? And he will continue to say these things. Well, let me tell you, the devil is a liar. God says, you are mine and you belong to him. And that's the confidence that we are called to live in today. That no matter what you're going through, no matter how difficult of a situation, no matter what happens to you in your life, it doesn't change the fact that you will always belong to God. And so we say to ourselves, yeah, I messed up. Yeah, I haven't really done what's really pleasing in the sight of God, what God really has desired for me at all times. But one thing that does not change is that I am still his. That's who I am, the redeemed Israel. I am his, he is mine. No matter what goes in my life, that doesn't change that fact. 
The reason why God kind of sets this up in verse 1 is he wants us to have the identity before we move on to verse 2. And when we look at verse 2, the first word that we see is when. When you pass through the waters. The first word is when, meaning that it's not a matter of if you're ever going to go through it, but when you go through it, there will be a time of difficulty, of situations and circumstances that you will face. When you are in that situation, don't forget what I've claimed you to be in verse 1. Right? Don't get so caught up in looking at the waters. Don't get so caught up in the focusing on the problem in itself that you fail to see where God is and who God is and who he has claimed you to be. The fact that my identity is not in, in the water, but in God who will walk me through every experiences that I go through. Maybe there are some of you right now in your life that you're going through, you're walking through the waters, and you feel like, will I drown? Will I survive this? Will I make it through? Well, remember what God says is that you belong to him and that you can't get through everything that you're going through in your life because he will be by your side. A lot of times we just want God to come and take away the problem. God, if you love me, don't let me go through the problem. But God says, no, I will be with you by your side and lead you and guide you to where you need to be. When you're going through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the flood, it shall not overwhelm you, overtake you because he has the power to stop the waters so that you can walk through the water on dry ground. In other words, we can continue to give God praise, not just in the situations, but because of who he is. You can begin to walk in victory and in confidence. Confidence no matter what's in front of you because you know who's got your back. And to kind of illustrate this, let me share um, a story that happened back in the day, right? Just a little bit about myself. I was born here in Seoul, and when I was seven, my family and I moved to the States. And I remember in fourth grade, um, I couldn't really speak English at all. I didn't know what was happening in that young age, all of a sudden having immigrated within a week. And I remember going to school, and I lived in a kind of a tough neighborhood. I grew up in New York City, and in that, there were, you know, a lot of racism was happening back then. It's probably still the same right now. But um, it was more so then that I felt like it because I was going through it. And I remember I had this one close friend. His name was LaShawn. And him and I played uh, basketball er after school every day. And there were times, even during school and recess. And one of the days we were playing basketball, these group of guys came and they started saying, calling me names and making fun of me. And I started uh, feeling uncomfortable. I didn't fully understand everything that they were saying. But all of a sudden, this Korean pride within me came about. And I was like, hey, I'm from Korea, man. I know Taekwondo. <laughs> and so I said, let's get down. Like, right, we started kind of wrestling or whatever it was we were doing. And I ended up kind of getting, being pushed to the wall and kind of had a scrape on my face. And all of a sudden, they saw blood and they started running away. And I went home that night, and I was like, oh, I'm in such pain. And the next day went by. I went through my uh, daily routines, go to LaShawn's house. We play basketball together. But one thing that I recognize is LaShawn had an older brother in the sixth grade named Marcus. He was about 6'3", uh, in sixth grade, right? 180 pounds on the football team. Nobody messed with this guy. He calls me. He's like, John, what happened to your face? I, I, my pride kicked in again. I was like, I don't know, man. I just fell. He said, no, no, what happened? And then LaShawn, my friend, started telling everything about, you know, actually, rethinking this story, where was my friend LaShawn when I was fighting those? <laughs> Anyways. Um, anyway, so Marcus asks me, he's like, what happened to your face? Who did that to you? And then my friend LaShawn started saying, hey, these group of guys came during recess, and they started making fun of John, and they are calling him names, and then they, they rumbled together, whatever. He's like, Marcus was like, okay, tomorrow during recess, I'm going to skip class and come to your recess. I'm like, you're sixth grade, man. Can you be cutting class in sixth grade? So he comes, and here's this giant of a guy making his presence known as he's walking into the field and the courts in recess. He says, hey, who did this to my brother's friend? And, he, he, and I was like, over there, right there, right there. <laughs> That's the guys right there. And so I led Marcus to the group of guys. And he's like, 
he slams the ball in their face. He says, if you ever touch my brother's friend again, this ball will be your faces. It's like, whoa. You know what? After that moment, nobody at school messed with me. They're like, you know who I know? Marcus. <laughs> Don't mess with me, man. I know that guy, that dude has my back, right? In a sense, spiritually, if you think about it, we believe and serve a God that is far greater than what we think he is. He's got our back, not only our back, but he goes before us and leads us. But yet, why is it as Christians, as children of God, who claim to say we are children of God, we belong to him, what he has done for us, and yet we live without this confidence and boldness. Let's remember who we really are, what kind of a God, what kind of a king we really serve. And through this, we have this confidence. And that's why, with this confidence, not because of who you are, but because of who he is, we're able to, in the midst of our storms, in the midst of our struggles, still can stand up and worship God the same. And when we begin to do that, it shows that even though the craziness that's going through in your life, people will come. What is it about you that you're able to still worship God in the midst of your situation? And to that, we praise the Lord because we believe in a God that is far greater and that we belong to him. And all I can say, my confidence is in him. I know him, not just know about him, but we know him personally and that we belong to him. And so we look at our lives right now because of sin in our lives, because of disobedience in our lives, because at times we become so hypocritical in our lives, we should have drowned by, by now. But God is keeping us alive, holding me steady, making a way for us in dry land. And God is telling us we are so that when time comes that we are able to get through some stuff and don't forget where we come from. So he has redeemed us. He has changed you from Jacob to Israel. He has called you by your new name. He told you who you belong to. And I keep saying this because, yes, there will be a time, no matter how long you've been going to church, no matter how long you've been a Christian, when we are faced with these certain situations, we have the tendency to have spiritual amnesia and just forget who we really are in him. And so he says, when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flames shall not consume you. When things of life get hot, when there are things that begins to heat up, when the intensity of life has a way of getting to us, he says, when the fire comes, you shall not be burned. And when we read this, we, we are reminded of the three Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. King Nebuchadnezzar sent out a decree saying, everyone should bow down before me at the sound of the trumpets. And here are these three Hebrew boys and saying, we're not bowing down to no king. There is no other king besides the king of kings and the Yahweh king that we serve. And so as a result of that, they are thrown into the fire furnace. Not only just a regular furnace, but it will be seven times hotter than usual. And it says, the Bible says, people, the guards who went near the fire dropped dead because of the heat. And so these three boys were thrown into the fire and there Nebuchadnezzar was, the king who didn't serve God, he looks in. He's like, hey, how many, how many people did we throw in the fire? He said, three. But I see a fourth, the angel of God. So a non-Christian, a non-believer was able to say, someone looks like the son of God. And sometimes we go through the fire situations, we go through some heat, and yes, it will be uncomfortable at times, but when we begin to hold on to our true identity and faith in Christ, that we know that he will protect us and guide us and lead us. We can live in confidence in that. And so because of that, again, we give God praise. We, we don't give God praise to earn credit, earn a merit, because nothing we ever do will ever measure up to that. But based upon who God is and what he has done for us, we just naturally respond. We thank you, Lord. And so we give you God praise. And he says the same thing, um, in, as he mentioned in the book of Daniel, in Isaiah 43, when life will make you uncomfortable because of the heat, don't forget your identity. Don't forget where you come from, that you belong to him, that he will take care of you. He's not going to stop the waters. He's not going to stop the fire. But what he will do is going, going to show you how to get through the waters and through the fire. 
And so verse 1 and 2 talks about who we are. And in case you forgot, he shifts and talks about then who he is. And the reason why that he can tell us who he is, uh, that, that he, we, we are the redeemed, that no matter what we go through, he's going to be with us. In verse 3 and 4, he says, let me reintroduce myself to you. Verse 3 says, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as, rans- as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you. In other words, you should have been dead. But I have substituted you for a group of people I have covered over you. He's willing to give nations. He's willing to give regions. He's even willing to give empires, the great things of that time, in exchange for you because he sees value and worth in you. And so the Israelites, they understood, hearing this from Isaiah, that Egypt and and Cush and Seba were in exchange those great things were exchanged for us and has given everything. And many times as, as children of God, we walk around wondering, am I going to get through this situation? Does God really love me? God, are you really there? And the answer is yes. For we, us, we know that God has expressed this type of sacrificial love for us. And in verse 4, it continues. He says, because you are precious in my eyes and, ha- and honored and I love you, I have given men in return for you, people in exchange for your life. There was a sacrifice. All the Egyptians that have passed to save the group of Israel, to preserve them. And this was the message for the Israelites. But we know at the end of the story of the Bible of what God has given to us, what he has exchanged our lives with, with the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ who hung on the cross in our place, lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we should have died, and through his life, death, and resurrection, we have access to the Father. And he reminds us who we really are in him. And so this is, God has given us everything so that we can begin to live the life that he has called us to. And I want to challenge you, as you go through your weeks, Whatever situations that you're going through in life, don't let Satan rob of you of that truth of who you really are in him. Say, I am a child of God. I belong to him. And you know what? He says, verse 4, because you are precious in my sight. You know, one thing, this word just automatically leads me to Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? Like, when Shmigo sees the rings, like, my precious I'm not such a movie person. Like, those are the two movies that I've seen in my life. Um, But he's like, my precious. And how he really treasures that. Well, I mean, this might be a bad illustration. That's not the way God looks at us, like Shmigo looking at a ring. But he considers us as the most treasure possessions, treasure things in his eyes. And he says we are honored, and on top of that, he loves us. He has given everything, the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ for us. And so, therefore, let's begin to live our lives with confidence, knowing that we belong to him, remembering who we are in Christ. Let's bow down in prayer. Just before I pray, if you can just pray on your own, just think about how in this world we deal with this identity theft that longs to steal who we really are, to make us forget And Satan comes to do these things, to steal, kill, and destroy. But thanks be to God that we have a God who comes to give us life, life to the full, life to abundance. Not only that, but reminds us who we are in him. That through the waters, through the fires, he will be with us and lead us throughout those times. No matter how difficult of a situation that you might be dealing with in your life right now, when those hard times come, Let's pray, God, we thank you for giving Jesus Christ the ultimate sacrifice, knowing that you are with us everywhere we go. You are the one leading us and guiding us every step of our lives. If you can just lift up a short prayer on your own, and I'll close us.
Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for reminding us of the truth that we desperately need to heed, heed to, Lord. Lord, so often throughout the week, we forget who we really are. That you call us royal, we are part of royal priesthood, Lord. We are people belonging to you, nations belonging to you, Lord. Lord, help us not to forget the fact that we are precious in your eyes, that you love us, that you honor us. We thank you for that. And that in the midst of the situations and problems that we go through in life, help us to put our hands in the air and worship you, knowing that you are a God, the everlasting God, that claims us to be your children. Help us to live in that truth uh, moving forward. Lord, we thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.